very good morning and thanks for joining us for the CNBC Africa special. Now, Aspen has been in the spotlight of late on speculation that the company is the next victim of U.S. investor group Viceroy Research. Aspen's shares fell 10% in early January on the back of rumours that the pharmaceutical company is the subject of a Viceroy report expected to be published in due course. Viceroy Research shot to fame in market circles when it released a damning report that into Steinhoff's accounting irregularities. Now, many local and global investors, including pension funds, lost huge tranches of money when Steinhoff CEO Marcus Yuster resigned and the share fell almost 90% in December 2017. Post the Steinhoff scandal, many market players are battered and bruised and are now on high alert, determined not to be caught off guard again. And fund managers are scrutinizing companies they don't fully understand and looking for signs that Steinhoff is not an isolated case. Enter Aspen Pharmacare Holdings Limited, a hugely successful South African multinational that has expanded aggressively through acquisitions, owns businesses in multiple jurisdictions, and has a long-serving, charismatic, chartered accountant CEO. Joining us now for an in-depth CNBC Africa exclusive is the charismatic CEO himself, Stephen Saad. Thanks very much for joining us, Stephen. Well, you certainly seem indignant at being compared to Steinhoff. In a, in a recent Bloomberg interview, you stated that Steinhoff is as similar to Aspen as A is to S in the alphabet. Let's start there, sir. I think, you know, if we just go back to Viceroy, and I'm not an expert on Viceroy or on Steinhoff or Steinhoff's accounts for that matter. But, you know, if I look at what where Viceroy seemed to get their information, and remember that Viceroy are no different to any other analyst, in my opinion. You know, they analyze your company. There's many people over the years who put buys on Aspen, sells on Aspen, holds on Aspen. The, the difference in a Viceroy report was they seemed to have information that wasn't in the public domain. Um, and so, you know, we never were concerned with whatever Viceroy had to say because as a management team, we're comfortable that any information that we have out there that we know is in the public domain. So I think we've got to start in, in that area. In terms of being indignant, and so that was probably the first part, is there's an assumption that there might be information out there that isn't in the public domain there is. I mean, so, not so long Stephen, ago, I do just want to stop you there. Was, was a I do just want to stop you there on that clarity and for you to reiterate that there is no price sensitive information that management of Aspen Pharmacare Limited is holding back that the market does not know about. Absolutely, absolutely. The only information that we have now that the public don't have is really our results. Uh, and you know, our trading update is we have a December, our half year ends in December. So our trading update will be in February, as it always has been, and our results are on the first week of March. So to be that precise, is the 8th of March. Maybe I have a better handle on than hey, correct. Stephen, correct. the market seems um, to be panicking you know, about... There's, there's, yeah, the market is panicking about the intangibles on balance sheet. And I think if we can just take a step back and you can explain the accounting treatment of the intangibles. And uh, let's just get clarity and, and take time to take us all through the accounting treatment in this regard. So yes, ag agreed. So we'll talk about intangibles. The other, I mean, I've heard many, many, many different areas that they've been discussed. Um, and there's, but there's a two or three that, that keep repeating themselves. So. I think it might be worth touching on them all, and I think intangibles is one of them. So our business isn't about desks and chairs and, um, and debtors and creditors. We've got all of those things, but the reality is what is Aspen's assets? Aspen's assets are its brands. It has, uh, it has intellectual property. It has ingredients and formulas. That, that, is the, that is the Aspen business, but that's what we've got. So then somebody says, but look at that balance sheet of Aspen's. There's like 60 billion rand of intangibles. That's a lot of money. It's your biggest asset. How do I as an investor get comfort on 60 billion rand? 
And I think that's, that is the first point. So is your absolute intangible number too high? Does it make sense? And my answer to you on that is very simply. Aspen does 40 billion rand of sales. If we had to try and buy that 40 billion rand of sales, if we went and bought products out there, you wouldn't be able to buy them at one and a half times sales. You wouldn't even be able to buy increasing brands at three or four times sales. So the, the value on our balance sheet in aggregate is less, is, is much less than the market value of those intangibles. And if you're not sure, then that's a very simple rule of thumb to use. Look at our multiple of sales and say, wow, the, the, the intangibles must be a lot higher than that. I think that's a pretty obvious one. You can see what we've paid for intangibles like anesthetics, et cetera, which are in multiples of three times or so by the time you talk it all in. And so our intangibles are not huge. Then we talk about the accounting treatment of those intangibles. So there's many ways to treat intangibles. You can depreciate them over a period as you see their useful lives of, uh, is how one should look at intangibles. When we look at intangibles in pharmaceuticals, you've effectively got three areas you can look at. You look at generic intangibles. You can write those down over a period. And generally you say, if we first to market, this is what happens. In a couple of years, there's five or six of them. And now it's not worth as much because simply not making as much money or any money because you've got more competition. It's been commoditized. Now, in our South African business, where we have a lot of generics, bear in mind the intangible value there is next to zero. But I do, what I should point out to, to, the, to the viewers is if I go back nearly 20 years ago when we bought South African druggists and I take those same brands, no new brands in generic, those same Panama still paint the brands that we had 20 years ago and look at their turnover then and I look at their turnover today, they are much higher in value than they are today. So although they don't have an intangible value, they actually have more value than when we bought them simply because they do more, et cetera. So you don't write up intangibles if they're positive. So, Stephen, just to, just to product, clarify here, are, to, are we talking about an indefinite lifespan? So in our products, we don't have patented products that you put over a patent period. And they're not, the, the ones we have indefinite are not generic products either. They have an indefinite lifespan. What is it indefinite? It means that you take every single brand, you look at its cash flows each year, those that are bigger or better than when you bought them, you don't write them up. Those that are worse, you impair. And that to me is logical. And if you're trying to look for an impairment, at the end of the day, what are you trying to look for in a business? You're looking for cash and cash generation. And the reality of these intangibles is while Aspen's turnover is going up, those intangibles are worth more. Um, but indefinite means that you only take the negative. So when something's bad, you write it down. If something's good, you don't write it up. That's the Aspen policy. It's been our policy for over a decade. I don't know why it's come to the fore. Well, I know why it's come to the fore now, but it's got, it is a policy that, that also probably best recognizes the cash generation within the business. There's a relatively damning report out the there. There's a relatively damning report out there by Nigel Dunn, published on Biz News. This is a stock market expert with some 30 years' experience, and he's taken traditional ratios, uh, return on assets under management, Rome, and he said that uh, your metrics are deteriorating or look worse than that of Steinhoff on return of assets under management, and then also taking your interest paid, dividing that by profit before tax, and saying that also looks dismal in comparison with Steinhoff. Your response to Nigel's assertions? Well, I think there's two issues there. We're going to the sort of debt and the quality of the earnings, and we're going to the ability to utilize assets, and then you make a comparison with Steinhoff. Um, so let me stick to, to, to those facts rather than comment on sort of the, the sort of people that write these type of things. So the, the caution to all viewers is that everybody's got, everybody's got a view. Uh, some people, and sometimes the view has got self-interest. So some people have got Aspen shares, they might speak positively on Aspen. Some people have got shorts on Aspen or, or don't have Aspen shares. And so it's in the interest maybe to speak negatively, either to acquire the shares or to protect their position. So for investors out there, you've got to be very wary of what you hear, both positive and negative. But let's deal with these questions raised by, by a report. Or the, let's talk about quality of earnings. What is quality of earnings? Because these words are used loosely. In my opinion, a quality of earnings are businesses that convert their operating profit 
into operating cash flows. Now, Aspen, the fortunate thing about Aspen, it hasn't been around for one year. We've been around for 20. We faced many, many challenges along the way, and we can talk about those separately, but let's just, very similar type of areas, very similar type of uh, discussions that we've had today, different circumstances, but, but end results. But let's talk about quality of earnings. If you look at 20 years, has Aspen converted its operating profit to operating cash flow per share? Over 20 years, it's almost mimicked operating cash flow. That's very different to, the, to some of the other companies that have been looked at, and it means, in my opinion, that is where quality begins and ends. Then you look at what goes on out below that and say, well, what goes on below that? There's two things. You get depreciation. You're either buying uh, assets, so you're building plants, or, or you're buying intangibles or products like we buy. And that's a financing decision. Do I use debt? Do I use equity for it? What should give people the most amount of confidence? Aspen has chosen to always use debt because the easiest thing if you've got a problem is to use equity. But we use debt because we know we're so strong in cash generation, we can pay it back. So let's look at some of the matrices that we used in this. Okay, depreciation. Why is Aspen's depreciation lower, but we're spending so much in CapEx? That's because we're investing in our future. We invest in our future because the more we bring into our factory and build a factory, the lower our cost of goods are. The lower our cost of goods, the more sustainable we are into the future. In terms of the intangibles, we have bought intangibles for 20 years. And of course, we would, if we think that our, we're going to have too much debt, we would have an issued equity. There's no problem with issuing equity in Aspen. There's an absolute appetite, as the, the sale of the GSK's tranches showed. There, there's, these billions of rands were covered in, in, min, in, in less than an hour. So it's not, it's a conscious choice by management to issue to issue debt and not equity. While we're on that line that item. They issued lost their equity. And I'm not While we're on that line item, I just want to also refer to Marcel Jankelau's re report from Investec Asset, or from Investec Securities rather. In fact, it was commentary rather in a MoneyWeb interview. And that is that you have no off sheet balance no off-balance sheet financing structures, as in the case of Steinhoff. And that's something that we need to take into account. I think it's important. We, we, what you see is what you get. And in terms of our debt, there is nothing off-balance sheet. But also to bear in mind that all we've got 40 or 50 billion rand of equity. So that's debt, less equity. All of that, all of that equity has only come out of generating cash flow and retaining those earnings after paying dividends in our own company. You can't make that. You can create more equity by issuing more shares. We haven't done, we have built this business out of strong cash flows. We've been owner manager of the business. We're not, yes, we see us, but we were owner managers of this business and we don't treat it every cent. We treat it as our own and we've got a good culture on that. I mean, the second point you raised goes to liquidity. One of the liquidity ratios, I think you said, the analyst used, uh, it just you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you said interest paid over... Profit, profit before tax. tax. Interest now, paid I mean, over profit due before tax. Now, now, with all due respect, I had near... Uh, there's, you know, if you want to talk a story, I mean, either, either the liquidity ratios I'm used to seeing is that you don't look only at interest paid, you should net off interest. So if you use the metrics you used, you might come to about three times. Look at the metrics that we have uh, with our banks, et cetera. It, we had seven times. We are very well covered. Why are we well covered? Well, because first of all, you take interest received and, uh, and you net it off against that interest paid number. That then brings down your numerator. When you look at your denominator, you say, okay, when I, when I look at, why are we looking at profit before tax? Profit before tax, you've already paid the interest. Really what the, the, the normal way to look at how panels are covered is say, how much cash do you generate? How much is your operating profit? You either die and add back your non-cash item depreciation and amortization. If you do that in Aspen's account, you're going to get a number of more than double the numbers that you've seen. I think these are, these are things where investors just have to be careful uh, in, in terms of how one looks at issues. And then the final point I think you made was, well, you know, our ratios are worse than Steinhoff, so on a line, one apart, I can't remember the thing. Yeah, return, so. return on Let's assets under management. one thing. Under management. A return, okay, sorry, yes. Okay, on the return of assets under management, of course, I, the, 
we have had declining returns on assets. That's absolutely correct. Um, but, you know, one would expect that if you make an acquisition, because as soon as you make an acquisition, you increase your asset base. Now, when you look at Aspen, our build programs take up to five years. Not only the build, but the moving of products. So you spend a lot of capital. You spend a lot of assets. Uh, so your asset goes up without necessarily getting the throughput through your facilities. So, of course, you're going to get a declining base. What you should do is look to say, is this where does it bottom out? Where does it turn? Now, where I'm very comfortable, if you look at the last six months in constant currency, you know, our, our profits went up by, by 37% at a, at a constant exchange rate. In the last six months now, I, in, in our opinion, management's opinion, we bottomed out, and now we're starting to extract the synergies out of these transactions. Now, if you look at the history of Aspen, we've extracted synergies all along the way. We've, been, we've faced this many, many times in the past. So we had, when we bought South African Druggers, for example, the, uh, you know, everyone said, oh, the mouse wanted the elephant. Interest rates at that stage were going 22 to 25%. We couldn't get a single investor to take a share in Aspen at four bucks at that stage. I mean, remember, we started at 53, at four rand or six rand, we couldn't get an investor. Hardly had a subscription, had to take on the debt. People were skeptical. We went to Australia just after Legionnet had crashed, and I think Pick and Pay and some of the retailers hadn't done very well in Australia. Aspen will fail in Australia. Share, no, no support, share price crash. We proved that we could survive in Australia. When we went for our global expansion, we had the same thing. You can do it in a couple of geographies that are English speaking, you're not going to do it globally. So what I'm you're saying, saying you, what you're saying is that you have seen team. you've seen these market moves before and the sense of panic uh, with no justification. Yeah, well, there was justification. In fairness, it's not easy. It's really not easy to achieve uh, a multinational status or to go global or to be successful in Australia alone, for example, or to have bought South African druggists and say, well, we think as a management team we can do better than the previous management team that ran it for 20 years. So people are justified to be skeptical. But, you know, to be successful in life, you have to do better than average. You have to swim against the tide. And I would have thought that Aspen has proven this over and over and over again in everything that we've achieved. And, you know, in this one, all I'm saying is we've got synergies. We've told you we've got synergies. We're very excited by our business. Uh, and, yes, sit, look, watch and wait. But we in no, we're in a better situation, an easier situation now with what we've got asset-wise relative to all the other transactions in our history where people once again were, were, were skeptical. So, so Stephen, I just, again, I just want to simplify it. I want to ask you a very direct question. You, at the end of the 2017 financial period, you had 37 billion rand of debt on balance sheet. Uh, again, looking at comments from Marcel Jankelau, Investec Securities, that's expected to tick up to around 41 billion rand in 2018. That level of debt, sir, is not keeping you awake at night. You don't deem yourself to be light on interest cover, given the low interest rate environment, which could tick up at some stage. Okay, so I hear you. So it, it could tick up, agreed, it could tick up. But what you've got to bear in mind about Aspen is that we churn our cash. Here's a company that's going to make a billion dollars plus minus, depending upon dollar, of EBITDA. Aspen isn't a small company anymore. As much as we see ourselves as coming from our little home in Durban, we make a billion dollars of EBITDA. In coming to covenants and where we are, we have got we, the ratios that we're using three and a half times, they within norm. They're not big, they're not high. So to go even back to the report where you say, well, we compared you with Steinoff and your debt looks the same. And, well, there's a fundamental difference that people keep missing here. And it sometimes can be a bit frustrating, and, I'm, and that's possibly why I make comments like A and S, is that there was nothing wrong with the covenants in Steinoff and there was nothing wrong with them. So to compare us with the Steinoff grass fine. But that was Steinoff as we thought we knew it. I don't know what Steinoff is today, but all I deal with is fact. And the only fact I've got out there that I know for sure is that the Steinoff accounts are incorrect in 2016, 2017, and maybe 2015. So something's wrong. And something wrong is likely to affect both profit and level of debt, which means that that ratio is not right. So to compare us with an, an artificial Steinoff ratio, which was fine in Steinoff's times, it would have been fine had they had the profit and that level of debt. I mean, you can sit with any bank and we sat with our bankers, but you know, one thing we've been trying to be is be very strong in communication. I don't like false information out there. We 
spoken directly to our bankers. We have the absolute full unequivocal support. They see our numbers, they see our, our balance sheet, but it's, there is nothing wrong with those type of companies. And if we believe we had a problem, remember, we fully invested in Aspen, fully invested, we don't got margin calls and all of those things, fully invested not only financially, but time-wise, emotionally. So Stephen, let's, let's also just totally pause committed. there, because again, <laughs> because again, <laughs> your supporters are saying that you have extensive skin in the game when it comes to your own exposure to Aspen, unlike um, uh, Marcus Eurster's exposure to Steinhoff. You are deeply, deeply invested in the Aspen story. Deeply invested, and it's way beyond money. Deeply. What has upset me, where I get so upset, and the reason that really precipitated some of uh, my comments into the, to, to the media, etc., is that it is so sad the abuse that investors take. And it's the small investor who, who read an analyst report that might be a public one that's not available, doesn't have internal, reads a public one that may or may not have a vested position. Maybe they're just not as sophisticated as some of the bigger, some of the bigger institutional investors. And, and our, our sort of line here at investors is just nonstop. And it's Mr. A and Mr. B from the street. Hundreds of people phoning into Aspen and saying, please phone Vastrip, please can you talk to them, tell them it's not Aspen. And people are losing money, and it's the private investors that are definitely have suffered the most in, in, in a rather irrational period. I want to bring to the fore that a comment that David Shapiro made recently from uh, Sasfin, and uh, that was that Christo Visa had 5 million Aspen shares. And given the pressures that he was under, obviously, to generate cash or to liquidate some of his positions, he accordingly dumped those shares, and that may have been the start of the panic and moved the share price uh, extensively when that tranche went into the market. Oh, and, and, and agreed. And you know, we've got to get we've got to get a difference between what's manipulation and what's normal market because there are many analysts out there who buy and put buyers and sells on Aspen at any point in time. And that's not manipulation. They're out there and they're writing these things. And it's the same when these it's like any economy. Or economic argument when you have more supply than demand then you know so be it the share price goes down if uh, christo visa drops aspen shares and it goes down by more it seems to make sense he's put more can you confirm Stephen, can, Stephen, can you confirm can you confirm that christo visa sold five million aspen shares in one tranche i i i, I can't tell you in tranches i can't tell you that christo visa sold a substantial number of shares and uh, through, I, I'm told through a holding company, I can't remember, began with a T, and there was, uh, it was four or five million shares. It was, it was a big number of shares. Um, and certainly that created, so I've got no problem with that. That, that is how shares go down. Unfortunately, those are things that we as investors and you as investors and management, those are things we have to live with. Those are realities. And they do tend to write themselves. We, we went to the, we have lodged a complaint with the FSB. Now, why did we lodge the complaint with the FSB? It's not because now before Christo Visa or I do, else I do want to bring in something else here because That's there are a number of market players out there who are reacting to your wanting an investigation or for your lodging that complaint with the FSB. And uh, Pete Fulhoun, you'll be familiar with Pete Fulhoun from ReCM, on Twitter basically saying, uh, if an analyst writes a positive report, and your share price jumps higher, that's market manipulation, and he hashtags Aspen, hashtag ridiculous, your response. I completely agree with him. I think that there are people writing reports all the time, plus and positive, negative reports, and I think that that's, that is, uh, I think that's fine. I think there's no, I, I could not have an issue with but that. But he's I saying, you he's look, saying you, you I mean, Stephen, he's saying right. you're overreacting by calling for an, SF, uh, for an FSB inquiry into uh, what you purport to be market manipulation of Aspen's share price. So I think that the FSB should be, look, should be looking at this independent of Aspen raising issue. When you're sitting with 10 or 20 billion rand of movements in a company, if it's a lot of money, people to be making and losing in a very short space of time and my contention is we should ask the FSB to look at it because this is where I think there's manipulation if or potentially manipulation is that if that share price goes up 
and somebody, say a hedge fund's got a short list, and they go and whisper a rumor and say to somebody, by the way, have you heard, link it to a viceroy report, it could or couldn't be Aspen. Why would Aspen ever be in a viceroy report if there's nothing not in the market domain? So, but if you go and whisper that, and as a result, people sell on these rumors, then I believe, in my opinion, you've manipulated the market. If you manipulated the market, my understanding is the sanction is criminal. At the very least, let's have an investigation. I'm not saying that anybody manipulated the market. Let's have a look and let's see if people took advantage of people's fears to, to try and link and create rumors that were not true. Stephen, are you 100% are, are sure? Because are you 100% sure that you are not the subject of a Viceroy report, remembering that Viceroy didn't contact Steinhoff management before releasing that report? I, I don't, to be, to be quite candid with you, you know, I don't, Viceroy to me, a couple of months ago, was an affordable brand that I used to be able to afford at Varsity. That's what Viceroy meant to me. Viceroy's report should mean no more than the sell report that some people have asked, or buy report and others. Why do I say that? There isn't anything in the public domain that the management of Aspen are aware of that could that Viceroy, anybody else could latch on and say, oh, I heard this and you've got that deck there and you didn't actually disclose this over here. There's none of that nonsense. So they could write a report tomorrow, but it would be no different to what any other analyst would write. We also need to touch on your relationship with Marcus Joerster. Now, there are all sorts of assertions out there. One of them um, may seem somewhat frivolous, but uh, you don't have a pension for buying up Marcus Joerster's horses, do you? Oh, okay. Now, we, you know, I've had... This has been... And, and I get every single rumor that you can possibly imagine. And I, I, I'm, yeah, so you raised that one. That was something I heard on my cycle. I heard this on a cycle the other day too. Have I bought Marcus Yost's horses? Now, to be, I, I'm embarrassed to tell you this now that I've read what I've read. I didn't even know Marcus Yost had horses. And if anybody who knows me well will know there's far more chance of me buying a rhino than being buying a horse race or a race horse. Um, but no, so the simple answer is no. But it's just, it's just a very good example of how these rumors just spread and go out of control. And it's important to be able to just, let's just make rational calls and decisions here. There was, a, there was another rumor out there that, again, it's just coming back to your relationship with Marcus Yostow and trying to establish what that is, but that you did sit on a board in an Investec-related company with Marcus Yostow and that he resigned from that board in December. Have you sat on a board with Marcus Yostow? So, so, you know, in, in fairness, I, you know, look, I'm, I'm very happy to explain all those things. But, you know, Marcus, I, I, I've met Chris, I don't think I've ever met Chris Dovisa, for example. And I, I've met Marcus Yuster twice in those board meetings. I was, and Marcus Yuster was actually chairman of those meetings. So it's a completely independent investment. Uh, invest, it's a personal investment. Uh, the company, made, if I'm correct, by the company Kossel. is IEP. Is right. that correct? IEP. Exactly. Um, and to be honest, I've met him twice. And to, to, to I must be upfront with you and tell you, I thought he was really smart and very charming and very down to earth. And he's charismatic. <laughs> so, but I, I've got nothing negative to say about him out of the, the, the two meetings that I've met Marcus Yuster. I think you must be careful with that charismatic term. It, it seems to be a negative um, after the Steinhoff uh, scandal. Okay. Well, so, we almost at the end well, I mean, of. That's worse. Because I think the problem with charismatic is that you have. I think the problem is not the word charismatic. I think the problem might be charismatic chartered accountant because I think that's where the contradiction in terms comes. And so sadly, that's where it is. I mean, and that together with the the sort of the duration that you know that's the other thing I've heard a lot of. You know, you've been here for for twenty years and you take on the face of the company and. One has to be careful. And, you know, my view on that is simple, you know. You don't stay here for 20 years unless you, you perform or proceed to perform. And, yes, there's been Marcus Yuster. And, yes, I also heard Adrian Gore's name thrown in. He's done, done a great job in discovery. So has Richard Branson. So has Warren Buffett. People have been around a while. In Aspen's case, my simple defense is, and I'm trying not to be defensive about it, but for, we're now into our 20th year. For, for 20 years, half on half, year on year, We've delivered earnings growth, normalized headline earnings growth. Every year, compound growth rates in the 
never a doubling or a trebling in one year. It's just been consistent growth, plugging away year on year. And, you know, if that's a crime, so be it. But I will tell you that there are CAs who 20 years or, and uh, managers of 20 who will fail. The likelihood is that the failure rate of longer term CEOs is, should be a lot lower. Stephen, they, uh, we are term. running out of time. But, know, just, if, uh, we are running out of time. And there are two more questions that I really need to ask you. The, the other, and, and just so that we put all uh, the, the relative issues on the table and everything that the market is talking about. But there are those that are saying you have been the subject of international investigations and, and particularly alluding to the fine by the Italian uh, Competition Commission with regards to the pricing of uh, your drugs, some of your drugs in, in the cancer-related area. Just a brief comment on that purported similarity to Steinhoff and the international investigations. So uh, our, our, our numbers are absolutely quantifiable. If you look at where we sit with on the on, in the regulatory environment, I've told people again, I said again, we're selling these products at two euros a tablet. It's not exorbitant. And there's a limit on the fine on, on what we've done. We're doing 40 million return. And it's a one-sort. It's not sitting there saying, well, we're not sure about your accounting, legal, your tax or whatever it is, which are sustainable problems that go to the core of the issue. You know, our regulatory issues... And, and I really don't make, mean to make small of our regulatory issues. And they, we take them very, very seriously. The people close to know know how personally we've taken it as an organization, how upset we are. But our regulatory, our, our regulatory issues are no different to Global Farm. And I, I just encourage anyone who wants to have a look, please open any single multinational Global Pharmaceutical industry, look up regulatory, look up legal, and we've got a small section. You know, I'm just speaking to our global leadership team. I want to have a zero section as aspect. We stand for quality, affordable medicines. That's what we stand for. That's our mantra. That's what we've delivered. We haven't spoken the words. We've delivered that for 20 years into this environment. Stephen, it's a completely different regulatory issue. It's quite difficult to, 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 to compare. To tax or, or exactly. And I mean, even the, the, the furniture versus the, the uh, comparison to the, the medicines, to the products in your uh, portfolio. Uh, is a little far stretched. But uh, one other question, and we'll close out on this one. Your relationship with your auditors, and uh, the, the simple way to ask this, is it too good or is it bad? No, I don't think you have a good or bad relationship with auditors. I think very simply in life, and my late father told me this, and it's a, such a brilliant lesson that we learned in life. And I, you know, we had somebody who wanted to buy ARVs through Africa, and they were going to pay us prices that were too high. And I said to my, my uh, the guy that came to me, I said, this doesn't look right. He said, no, it's going through. It's an agent. I said, but it doesn't look right. It doesn't smell right. Uh, and it didn't feel right. And so regardless that there was through a third party, we didn't do the transaction. And it was a very simple lesson I gave him, a lesson I learned from my father. You can never change a crooked stick. A stick is either crooked, and you can't change that. And Aspen simply does things properly. So if we have a good or bad relationship with the auditors, I don't know. We have a relationship where we produce numbers that everyone is, is are credible. Yes, there are debates over all issues about lifespans, this, that there's always the normal debates, cutoffs, or whatever it might be. But our relationship with our auditors is a professional relationship. I think our auditors have been, uh, will, I, I think, are, are excellent. But mostly, it doesn't matter how good or bad your auditors are. I think our financial team, Gus, Sean, and our full financial team are credible, honorable, and Aspen has acted with integrity for 20 years. And for as long as I'm here, and everyone in this team's around here, that is what Aspen will always stand for. We won't have Stephen, problems with Stephen, just lastly. Funny things. Just lastly, you've been, the, you've been inundated with emails and telephone calls from analysts, uh, private investors, et cetera, et cetera. While we are putting everything on the table, is there anything that we've left out, that I've left out, uh, in terms of asking you today that we need to address? Any important issue that we, we need to deal with before we, we close? Yeah, I think, you know, I've got to, I, I really would like to speak to the investors, particularly the private investors and the small investors. You know, the reality is that sometimes you hear a rumor and then you you don't sell and you get caught out. And that might have been what happened in the style of debacle. I would tell you this, because we're in a close period, so it's hard for me to say much more than this without, without breaching um, my duties. But all I would tell you is, in life, there's rumors and there's facts. We, our results in Aspen and our trading updates are out shortly. I ask that you please 
deal, in fact, um, because to deal in rumors at a time like this is, is probably not the right when there's so much fear and so much anxiety around, and rightly so. These are massive, this is a massive corporate that's fallen around us. But please, I just ask that you carefully consider your position, and the facts are going to be out soon. It's not a long way away. Please wait for the facts. Stephen, thank you so much for your time. Much appreciated. Stephen Saad is the CEO of Aspen Pharmacare Holdings Limited, joining us in an exclusive interview live from Aspen Pharmacare's headquarters in Durban. Thank you so much for joining us.